Accessory exercise is defined as supplementary work used to address weak points or focus on specific characteristics needed for a sport. When your sport is lifting barbells, many agree accessory movements are very important for long-term success. A heavy barbell deadlift, for example, is incredibly effective, but it takes a lot out of you. If you can get a similar training effect doing something less taxing like a good morning in place of the deadlift, recovery will be less of an issue. Part of the reason heavy compound barbell movements are so draining is due to the fact that you can load them up so heavy, but another equally as significant part is a bit more difficult to describe, and I don't think I would have noticed it if I hadn't switched over almost entirely to sandbags in place of barbells myself. For whatever reason, barbells, iron in general, is harsh, and it can leave you feeling beat up. This doesn't seem to be the case with sandbags. Sandbags just don't take it out of you in the same way. Sure, they'll wear you down quick, but you're almost left feeling refreshed and healthy, rather than run down and in need of extra recovery days. A commenter on one of my videos gave a great analogy. It's like jumping on concrete versus sand. I think this paints a great picture. Sure, you can jump higher, and possibly even for longer on the concrete, but that harsh impact is going to take time to recover from. Jumping on sand, on the other hand, isn't very harsh at all. The impact is blunted by the sand, which leads to less fatigue. It's also more difficult to jump on sand, which means you can get more out of each jump, and when you go back to jumping on concrete, you'll feel much stronger by contrast. You could say jumping on sand is a way to get more for less, or more stimulus for less fatigue. This means, in my opinion at least, the need for accessory movements using different implements is less important for sandbag lifting. If your goal is to shoulder a heavy sandbag, you can, for the most part, just keep on lifting the sandbag in whatever way you think necessary, using a high frequency, and you'll probably make great progress and feel great in the process, assuming you're using a bag that suits your current strength level. That said, just because accessory exercises may be less important doesn't mean they aren't still effective. Sometimes you might just want a break, or maybe you want to focus on specific aspects of sandbag lifting without having to actually lift the thing. Also, just because a sandbag may be less harsh on the body than a barbell is, we are still talking about heavy lifting here, and some time away on occasion is a great idea. So, introduction out of the way, here are three great sandbag accessory exercises using alternative implements that will improve your lifting without adding too much additional fatigue. First up is the swing. Usually done with a kettlebell, though I've always liked the plate version myself, the swing directly improves what I consider to be the most important part of lifting a sandbag, the lift from the lap to chest height. Before getting into why the swing works so well, let's discuss why the lift from the lap to chest height is so important. If we look at three of the main fundamental sandbag exercises, the carry, the shoulder, and the press, we'll see that the lift from the lap determines our success. If you're trying to shoulder a sandbag, bringing it higher on your chest with that initial lift from the lap means you have less work to do later on. Let me give you an example. Two lifters are trying to shoulder a heavy sandbag. Lifter 1 hasn't yet learned the importance of that first lift and puts in half effort. The sandbag now rests at just about sternum height. Lifter 1 now needs to move the bag all the way from the sternum to the shoulder. Because you can't generate as much power from the position you need to be in to hold the sandbag while standing upright, it takes Lifter 1 three additional heaves to shoulder the bag. Now Lifter 2 knows how important the lift from the lap is and puts every ounce of effort he can muster into bringing the bag as high as he can. Lifter 2 manages to throw the bag all the way up to his upper chest. From this point, it only takes one additional heave to shoulder the sandbag. In this example, both lifters managed the shoulder, but as the weights get heavier, lifter one will be at a major disadvantage. It all comes down to the rebound effect. Think about the technique you'd use to jump as high as you can. You'd initiate the jump by first bending the ankles, knees, and hips, then forcefully unbending or extending those same joints to generate power. Each of those joints have muscles responsible for that extension. When you have a sandbag on your lap, you can make full use of every single one of those muscles to lift it. Now, compare that to when you have a sandbag at chest height. 
For the most part, you can still make use of the muscles associated with the ankles and knees, but you're seriously limited when it comes to the hips, which is a major issue considering the muscles responsible for hip extension, mainly the glutes, are some of the strongest in the entire body. Imagine trying to jump without bending at the waist. You wouldn't get nearly as high. This is why, if you want to shoulder a sandbag, you'll have a lot more success if you focus more on that lift from the lap. The same is true for the press. First off, you can't even try to press the thing if you can't get it into the front rack position. And on top of that, if you do manage to get it there, but it took you 3 heaves and 15 seconds to do it, will you have the energy needed to complete the press? A strong lift from the lap is essential. Finally, if we look at the carry, contrary to how it feels in this position, you will be able to carry a sandbag for longer if you bring it high up on your chest versus down at stomach level. The lower you hold the sandbag, the more you'll be relying on your arms rather than your upper back, and 100% of the time your arms will wear out first. With all of this in mind, it should be clear why the lift from the lap to chest height is so important. Back to the swing. The swing movement mimics the lift from the lap in many ways and lets you focus directly on building power there without having to worry about holding on to a heavy bag. The swing can also act as a hypertrophy exercise for the entire posterior chain. Think high rep deadlifts without the insane fatigue, and you'll be using every single one of these muscles when lifting a sandbag. Don't forget, a bigger muscle has more strength potential, and more strength potential means lifting heavier sandbags, which in turn leads to even bigger muscles, and so on. I mentioned this briefly in the earlier example, but most importantly, the swing builds your glutes, and the glutes are key. The glute max is actually the largest muscle in the entire body, and is directly responsible for a large portion of your power. Said plainly, do swings, build your glutes, become powerful. As for programming the swing, you'll want to keep the load relatively light and the reps per set relatively low. Using a lighter weight will ensure you're putting forth max power on every rep, and keeping the reps low, I'd say 10 or less, means fatigue won't get in the way either. You can get away with a lot of volume on these, so going as high as 10 sets of 5 to 10 reps per set in a single workout is possible. Accessory exercise number two is the humble curl. I prefer doing these with an axle bar or using fat grips, but a plain old barbell works too. While the swing lets us further strengthen what is arguably the most powerful part of lifting a sandbag and further develop the strongest muscles, the curl lets us bring up the most common weak point in sandbag lifting, the biceps. Even though most of your strength comes from the bigger prime mover muscles, and in a perfect world we'd probably try to minimize bicep involvement, when it comes to lifting big, heavy, awkward things, there's just no getting around it. The biceps will be pushed to their limit. When you lift a sandbag off the ground, rather than keeping your arms locked out like you would when doing a barbell deadlift, you're forced to bend your arms near the top to clear the knees and lap the bag. On top of that, your arms will be in a neutral position which further involves the muscles of the upper arm. And for this reason, I also recommend doing hammer curls or swiss bar curls just as a bonus. I didn't realize how hard this is on the arms until I started lifting heavier sandbags. Less than an hour after my first session moving up in weight, I could feel a deep ache in what felt like the innermost part of my arms. Probably the brachialis if you want to get technical. It's like doing heavy weighted chin-ups. Sure your back is doing a lot of the work, but the biceps are heavily involved as well. At this point I should mention, while the arms do put in work when lifting a sandbag from the ground, I don't think they'll necessarily hold you back. If you can't lift a sandbag from the ground, most likely you just need to get stronger overall. I just wanted to mention that they are involved here. It's not until you get into the bear hug position that you'll really start to feel it. It doesn't matter how strong your legs or glutes or back is, it doesn't matter how high you can toss the sandbag up from the lap or how strong your press is. If you can't hold on to the thing, you won't be lifting it. This is why we need strong arms. Everything involved with flexion, from the fingers all the way up to the shoulders, must be strong to hold a sandbag in the bear hug position. This is also why I prefer thick bar curls, as you'll be working the lower part of the arm more as well. In addition to a base layer of general strength, the bear hug position also seems to require a type of specialized strength you don't really see elsewhere. We might compare this to the idea of straight arm strength from calisthenics. One of the main things holding people back from doing something like a planche is lack of bicep strength in the fully locked out position. 
When your arm training is done in the typical way, you develop great lifting and lowering strength, but the strength in that locked out position is limited because it's not trained directly. The bear hug position with a sandbag is like this, but it requires strength in a static flexed arm position. Not only that, but every sandbag has a different circumference, so you'll need static flexed arm bicep strength in pretty much every angle greater than 90 degrees. On the bright side, assuming you keep up with the direct arm work, you can develop this specific strength pretty well by just spending more time in that bear hug position. Dedicated arm training also lets you work through a complete range of motion, which is critical. One thing I can say about lifting sandbags is you can't always predict how things are going to go. That's just how it is. Sandbags don't like to do what you want them to, which is part of what makes them so great. But imagine if all your bicep training was focused on building strength at around a 90 degree angle. If a sandbag gets out of place, which it will, and for some reason you need to reposition it with your bicep in a very lengthened position, which again, you will probably have to do at some point, you'll be at a much higher risk for injury. And even if you don't get hurt, you most likely won't have the strength to finish the lift. On to programming. Any direct arm training is going to be infinitely better than none at all. But if you want to get really specific, I've had great success doing my curls for 10 sets of 3 with a reasonable amount of cheating on the way up and a 4 second negative. Doing this once a week for a few months will go a long way towards strengthening the arms for sandbag lifting. One positive here, if you don't like doing curls, you can get away with cycling your training a bit. A few months of direct work will catch you up to where you need to be, and at that point you can stop the direct work for a while if you'd like. And because sandbag lifting hits the arms so hard, you shouldn't lose any size or strength during that time. I generally prefer to keep going with the direct work just to make sure my arms are never a weak point, but it is nice knowing you can get away with taking a break for a while if you'd like. There is one last thing I'd like to mention about the curls. While doing a relatively heavy 10x3 is very effective, it does use up more recovery resources than using a lighter weight would. If you're going through a very intense and hyper-focused training phase where you're given everything you have to lift in heavy sandbags multiple times a week, it might be in your best interest to stick with basic lightweight training. Think typical bodybuilding work, though I don't like using the word that way. Although you probably won't gain quite as much specific strength doing sets of 15 with light weight when compared to the heavier 10x3, the gains in muscle size should be more or less equal. This kind of ties into the training enjoyment discussion. For most people, throwing around big weights will be much more enjoyable than slowly curling 65 pounds, but in the grand scheme of things, for me at least, lifting a sandbag will always be way more fun than curls, regardless of how I do them. So if I can put more into sandbag lifting by going the slow and controlled route with my curls, that's probably what I'll do. Again, you can cycle this as you'd like, and going through phases of lightweight and heavier weights both will probably yield the best results. Finally, before we move on, one more thing about the enjoyment factor. Personally, I hate curls. I always have, probably always will. When my only reason for doing curls was bigger arms, I skipped them more times than not. But once I realized that curls would make me better at lifting sandbags, I finally had a reason to focus on them. It's like I've been able to reach an agreement halfway. Though I don't like doing curls, I like that they make me better at lifting sandbags, so in a way, I can enjoy doing them. I think this middle ground might appeal to some people. Last but not least, sandbag accessory exercise number three is pull-ups. I made an entire video going over why sandbags and pull-ups go so well together, linked below if you're interested, but one thing I haven't talked about is how pull-ups actually improve your sandbag lifting. It all comes down to the lats. The upper back and the arms both play a major role in holding onto and stabilizing a sandbag in the bear hug position, but I think the real difference between someone who does well at bear hug carries and someone who struggles is lat size. Of course, size alone isn't enough, you also need to teach the muscles how to do what you want them to, but again, a bigger muscle has more potential. The easiest way to describe why is using the barbell deadlift as an example. Say what you want about the exercise, love it or hate it, the barbell deadlift is one third of a very popular sport, powerlifting, and has been around for decades. If there's one thing you can count on with a sport, it's the discovery and implementation of the most efficient methods down to the finest details. 
Well, you've probably heard the cue, pack your lats, during the setup. Why pack the lats? What people realized is, while the lats are responsible for vertical pulling movements like pull-ups or pull-downs, they're also great at stabilizing the spine. This is big news because, compared to the spinal erectors, the lats are absolutely massive. If you can involve the large lat muscles in the lift, then you lift more weight. What I found is, the lats are great at working isometrically for more than just stabilizing the spine. They can stabilize a sandbag in the bear hug position too. It's almost so obvious as to be funny. I don't know why it took me so long to realize that, in the bear hug position, you can actually see the lats almost wrapping around the sandbag, as if the lats themselves are giving the sandbag a hug. What you'll notice with the bear hug carry is, rather than one unchanging isometric, the muscles involved are actually performing hundreds of micro adjustments to keep the sandbag in place. You could say this is the definition of stabilizing something. A sandbag may be still in the bear hug position when you're just standing there, but walking around creates that unstable environment. Relating this back to the lats, this means absolute strength isn't what we're after. If we want our lats to stand a chance against possibly hundreds of adjustments in the span of a single carry, what we need is strength endurance, and this is why pull-ups are so great. Pull-ups force the lats to handle your entire body weight, which is exactly the size sandbag usually recommended as a first checkpoint when you're starting out. Uh, meaning, if you weigh 200 pounds, carrying a 200 pound sandbag for about 30 seconds is a great accomplishment. Pull-ups also force the lats to handle that weight for a long time, which builds exactly the type of strength endurance we need. Consider a basic set of 8 pull-ups. If the reps are controlled and each one takes 4 seconds to complete, the lats will have worked for 32 seconds, already more than that initial goal, and a basic set of 8 bodyweight pull-ups is only the beginning. The potential for increasing strength here is massive. Of course, if you need to use the lat pulldown or do banded pull-ups instead, there's absolutely no shame in that. We're all at different points on our way there. I think raw pull-ups are superior, but anything that builds that strength endurance is great. There's also lat size to consider. Pull-ups will grow your lats, no doubt about it, and bigger lats means more potential, again, but I also want to go back to that idea of the lats hugging the sandbag. I think this falls directly into the realm of bro science, but my theory is, the more surface area you have in contact with the sandbag, the stronger you'll be and the less work each individual muscle will need to do. If that's the case, wouldn't having massively wide lats that drape around the sandbag mean you now have more surface area covered? This would mean well-developed lats are a win-win more muscle at your disposal for holding on to a sandbag, and more surface area covered so each muscle has a bit less work to do, which means you can go heavier and for longer. Bigger and stronger lats help with other sandbag exercises as well. They'll give you more of a shelf to push from when pressing overhead, they'll help keep you upright when a heavy sandbag rests on your shoulder or is on the way up there. Like with deadlifts, they'll keep your spine safe when lifting from the ground. The role the lats play in sandbag lifting can't be stressed enough, and for that reason, I think pull-ups are a great accessory exercise. And that's going to be it for today. What are your favorite accessory movements for sandbag lifting using alternative tools? If you like this video and want to see more like it, let me know. Your feedback is always appreciated. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.